painter may know what he doesn't want, but let him beware if he ever wants to know what he wants. A painter's lost if he ever finds himself. And as for myself, the fact that I was lucky enough never to find myself, that's my only claim to merit. colors as her hand. Ernst the painter was also a poet. How many colors has a hand? He stifles the pine trees of childhood. He misses his career. He bores holes in the canopy of stars. He shakes races of mankind from his sleeve. One, two, three. He paints a keyhole on the wall and looks through it onto the helpless flames of the light. The painter paints the evening, he paints the goodly night, paints questions without meaning, and blows the sword with might. creeps under the earth's crust. He's delighted with sponges of slime. One, two, three. The painter paints for half the day and paints for all the night. He paints the Prince Elizabeth and blows the sword with might. Max Ernst, born Rhineland, 1891, Father a teacher, moderate income, a lot of children, a lot of worries. Max educated at a grammar school, then Bonn University. Army in 1914. After the war, new art movements, new friendships. In Germany with other artists, then in Paris with the Surrealists. Paul Eloi, the writer, writes this poem on Max Ernst. Devoured by feathers, submitted to the sea, he let his shadow pass in the flight of birds of freedom. His eyes are in a wall, and his face is their heavy ornament. One lie more by day, one night more, and there are no more blind. Max Ernst is the greatest poet and satirist of the painters of our age. The imaginary world he created is far too rich for anyone to exhaust everything that's in it. The painter, he says, has to tell stories, laugh, take sides, and at the same time mystify as much as he can. All the same, there are a number of things in his work which turn up again and again. Like the bird as the symbol of total freedom. Birds and humans got dangerously mixed up and confused in my mind. And they came out in drawings and paintings. As early as 1920, André Breton, the main theorist of the Paris Surrealist group, wrote that Max Ernst was a man whose artistic powers were, in a sense, absolutely unlimited. He has a captivating, unanswerable, totally incomparable mind. His message will shine on us all like a bright and vigilant eye and its light will brighten the darkness of our times. If you listen carefully, whatever the sound, you can hear just one song, a song he never tires of singing, to make his subject matter new, to wake up for criticism today from lethargy, from all its idiotic fear of change. His work spans the ages, opens up. The eye is more and more set free. It's a new creation. And around it, all those worn out idols of the past, over which now, the vulture hovers. As for Eloi, for him, Max Ernst is a bridge between literature and painting. 
I don't know if ever a poet was more deeply at grips with fundamental truths than Max Ernst. And that's the basic reason for seeing this painter as a poet and to admire him for it. Throughout his work, you find a desire to bring together colors, forms, events, feelings. People and objects, time and duration, nights, dreams and light. Max Ernst himself dissolves into what he shows us. He takes us through the earthbound world around us, up into a realm set free where everything makes sense. Max Ernst's first contact with painting was at the age of three. His father, Philip, had done a watercolour called Solitude, a woodland glade, a monk buried in a book. What the book's about remains a secret. The boy, Max, is fascinated. What's a forest? I had mixed feelings the first time I went into one. Delight, of course. Yet there was something oppressive as well. The joy of being in the open air, being able to breathe freely. But at the same time, a sense of being hemmed in. Shut in by hostile trees. Outside and inside. free and a captive. It was a puzzle. Who should solve it? To paint? Become a painter? The sun can only touch the top of this wood. The shafts of the trees cluster together to let nothing in from outside. Here we touch the heart of things. Have you ever seen the lyre bird, mad with love, dancing its dance amongst the ferns? Turn your longing to what can never be reached. Let it climb. The grammar school at Brühl, where the family lived. The pleasures and pains of pre-1914 schooling in Germany didn't harm young Max Ernst. The word duty he hated. While the words in the catechism, joys of the eye, lusts of the flesh and the vanity of the world, seemed marvellous to him. There were Sunday walks in the castle park. His father finds his diary and destroys it. Only a sketch or two survive. Max wants to be a painter, but the war puts an end to that. He joins the artillery. What's there to do in the face of stupidity, nausea, horror? It's no good crying or cursing. The intervals of action on the front produce a few small pictures from the trenches. Max Ernst died on the 1st of August 1914. He came back to life on the 11th of November 1918. A young man who wanted to become a magician and discover the myth of his age. After the mess of the war, a ray of hope from Zurich, Dada. Dada seemed to want to turn the accepted ideas of art inside out. When they held their first exhibition, there was a public outcry and charges of obscenity. Visitors to the show actually attacked and destroyed some of the things on view, but all the artists did was to replace them. Contrary to what people think, Dada didn't want to shock the middle classes. They were already shocked. They were so shocked that the police had to close the exhibition. Dada was at the same time an explosion of joy and a revolt of anger. The result of the absurdity, the bloody mess of a senseless war. 
we young men came out of it absolutely stunned, and our indignation had to express itself somehow. It was quite natural for it to do so in an attack on the basic assumptions of the culture that had produced this war. Attacks on language, syntax, logic, literature, painting and so on. Now came the first collages by Max Ernst, pictures made up of all sorts of different elements. I saw all sorts of advertisements for objects to do with mathematics, geometry, anthropology, zoology, botany. There were so many different forms and shapes there, and the absurd way they were combined made one's head spin. It conjured up real hallucinations and gave all these objects absolutely new meanings. I found my vision suddenly intensified. I saw all these objects as if they were completely newborn against a background which was totally new. So to art he brought a whole range of new subjects. Technology, advertising, the sweepings of the consumer society. All mixed up together just for the sheer pleasure and the shock of it. He was immensely inventive, even though certain themes, certain ways of putting a picture together occur time and time again. And right through his life, Ernst was to remain a master of the art of collage. Collage is a systematic exploiting of chance combinations, or artificially produced combinations, of two or more elements, elements totally unlike each other, against what would seem to be a totally unsuitable background. And also of the spark of poetry which comes when all this happens. Look at his collages, and the thing that strikes you is the feeling they have of being unmistakably his work. There's no limit to the sort of things he uses. Flowered wallpaper, lace napkins, playing cards, anything he comes across. Peace, war and the rose. The war dominates and threatens. It's a pallet with nails stuck in it, imprisoning the dove of peace inside. In recent years, he's produced very large pictures combining painting and collage objects. From very early on, he's liked creating cages, Cages with their birds gone, escaped. It's like life, he says, spent to some extent in a cage from which basically we all of us long to escape. But he uses everything for his pictures. Even the smock he was wearing when we were filming. The picture he made from it was entitled The Painter. He doesn't let you see that it's a face. We get a sense of horror if we observe certain moments of his dream. 
It's a sort of mediation between things. He wants to bring them together into a relationship totally foreign to them. Perhaps that's the only way Ernst finds it possible to live, to live freely. It's perhaps the root of his humanity. In the 20s, Ernst did the illustrations for a number of books by Paul Eloi. Then in 1933, when he was travelling in Italy, a collage novel called Un Semaine de Bonté, A Week of Goodness, or The Seven Main Elements. illustrations from 19th century novelettes to make sinister dream pictures. Pictures of the subconscious. Pictures to attack the evil and stupidity of mankind. They're about the brutality and violence in the air in the year they were made, 1933, when Hitler came to power in Germany. people have said that Max Ernst's work is metaphysics transformed into pictures. Well, if you ask him what he thinks about philosophers, he has an answer. The teachings of philosophy? A woman's nudity is wiser. Alongside this development of new techniques, Max Ernst also did paintings. They were surrealist in style, precisely executed, even though he'd never been to art school or earned any qualifications. Academic painting, as a result of his father, was anathema to him. His father's amateur copies of religious paintings. Among them, the Disputer of Raphael. As a boy of five, he'd been the model for his father's painting of the infant Jesus. As a contrast to his father's pious and sentimental Madonna, Ernst painted the Virgin as a buxom fishwife giving a hiding to the Son of Man. In 1926, the picture was denounced by the Archbishop of Cologne. Six years before, he'd got a letter from his father. My curse on you, he'd written. You have disgraced our name. St. Cecilia, or The Invisible Piano. Max Ernst's pictures of the early 20s are jokes, in a sense, at the expense of the themes and aesthetics of European painting. This one is called Two Children Are Threatened by a Nightingale. The garden gate hangs at the edge of the picture on real hinges. The bell push is a real one. His creation of Eve, or the beautiful gardener, was put on show by the Nazis in their exhibition of so-called degenerate art with the caption, Insult to German Womanhood. Since then, it's disappeared. In 1967, he painted a new version, 
the return of the beautiful gardener. But two very important paintings from 1921 do still exist. The elephant of Celebes, a walking gasometer, his trunk a long pipe, and at the end of it, the head of a bull. His head's an armoured turret. Standing next to it, the first of Max Ernst's women without heads. Celebes and Oedipus Rex, the other great picture of 1921, were bought by the Parisian poet Paul Eloire. And the same year Max Ernst went to Paris, lived and worked with Eloire and his wife, and painted the walls of their apartment. Some of these wall paintings were recently discovered in good condition under wallpaper and subsequent coats of paint and carefully removed from the walls. In 1924, Ernst travelled with the Eloise to Indochina and Indonesia. It wasn't long after his arrival in Paris before Ernst started to make friends with the artists living there. And he marked this friendship with a picture called The Rendezvous of Friends. There's a sort of group photograph with the surrealists arranged one behind the other, looking like drawing room dandies in exaggeratedly elegant clothes. Max Ernst sits on the knee of Dostoevsky. The Russian writer was one of the surrealists' great heroes. In construction, the picture is like Raphael's Disputer, and Raphael himself is number seven. André Breton, the high priest of the Surrealists, raises his arm and points like St. Paul in Raphael's picture up to the Holy of Holies. In 1928, Ernst painted another picture called The Rendezvous of Friends. The friends had become flowers, snakes, slugs, jackdaws, weeds, all sorts of plant and rock forms. In 1930, the theme got its third variation in a photo montage with newcomers to the scene. Yves Tongi, Alberto Giacometti, Man Ray and Salvador Dali. In the left-hand bottom corner, the Spanish film director, Luis Bunuel, and it was in his film, L'Age d'Or, The Golden Age, blasphemous, provocative for that time, that Max Ernst acted. He played the leader of a group of carefree bandits who come to grief because they're simply absolutely exhausted. Again and again, Max Ernst as an artist has drawn on his early experiences. Memories, for instance, of dreams he had when he was ill as a child. Fear of death and the powers of destruction. Things I imagined I saw in my fever on a panel of imitation mahogany opposite my bed. The markings in the wood came to look like one thing, then another. An eye, then a spinning top, then a nose, then the head of a bird, and so on. And later I consciously tried to recreate similar imaginings by looking at wooden panelling, clouds, wallpaper, unpainted walls, just to get my imagination working. Tenth of August, 1925, a rainy day, alone in a little hotel by the sea. I'm staring at the wooden floor. Then suddenly I notice something, that the markings start to move, a bit like the lines on the imitation mahogany panel I remember from my childhood. Like my visions then, when I lay half awake, half asleep. The lines move and flow into pictures. And then to keep my concentration going, I try to make a series of drawings from the boards. Quite haphazardly, I drop pieces of paper onto the floor 
and then rub over them with a black pencil. I'm astonished at the way suddenly my ability to look, to see, gets stronger. And in the same way, I try to question a whole lot of other possible surfaces and materials, the veins of leaves, the frayed edges of hessian and so on. The drawings that I got this way go beyond painting. And they've lost the character of the material they come from, thanks to a whole sequence of transformations. They begin to look like incredibly exact and accurate signs. It's the start of a new sort of natural history. Frottage is what Ernst called this, rubbing off surfaces and materials. And it's an equivalent in art to automatic writing in literature. The author limits the activity of his mind. He excludes any influence of meaning, any notion of taste or morality. At the end, he's a sort of spectator. Of course, the automatic quality of all this has been far too exaggerated. There's little doubt that the images that came were in fact controlled by a sort of aesthetic which had a firm grip over the element of chance. And Ernst's frottage pictures do sometimes even contain real elements and definite meanings. A bird flutters, caught between two walls. It's the idea of freedom in conflict with something hard and solid, a sort of prison. Later on, Ernst started to use sanguine, pastels, charcoal or coloured chalks instead of pencil for these pictures. And they made the compositions richer, more like paintings. Sometimes there's more than one technique. There's watercolour, line drawing, collage and frottage combined. But this technique became so assured, so flexible, that it was a logical step to transfer it to oil painting. And the technique resulting from it he called grattage, scraping. Ernst scrapes the colour off with a palette knife to reveal the surface below as a sort of bas-relief. Max Ernst's techniques, the complicated processes of his activity as an artist, or passivity, if you like, in view of his so-called automatic pictures, these had an enormous influence on the way art developed in this century. And he's the first and best example of allowing materials themselves to produce pictures, however much he remains in control. up the horizon, overcome the sun. Only a ring of it remains, no rays. The bride of the wind surrounds me. She rushes past at a gallop. I see barbarians who look to the west, barbarians coming out of the forest, barbarians marching towards the west. You slept too long in the woods. I see the greed of gardens, the gardens themselves consumed by the growth that springs from the wrecks of captured aeroplanes.
In these works tremble the senseless, irrational things that mostly men think of as dreams, though the artists know that they're the first breath of reality. I saw the nymph called Echo. When the Second World War broke out, Max Ernst was interned in the south of France as an enemy alien. Paul Eloi got him out. Then, when the Germans invaded, he was interned again. Later, it was the Gestapo who were to be searching for him. In 1941, he went to America, and on arrival in the States, he was once again arrested. A visionary picture about the destruction around him. A picture called Europe After the Rain. In it, it seems as if the world has come to an end. There were a lot of famous European artists now in exile in New York. Ernst himself, Chagall, Tanguy, Leger, Breton, Zadkin, Mondrian. Ernst was married for a while to the famous American patron of the arts, Peggy Guggenheim and it's she who financed an experimental film, Dreams That Money Can Buy. Ernst acted in one episode, which was based on his 1933 Week of Goodness collages. But the war and the immediate post-war years were bad for the Surrealists. The things they'd created in their imaginary world had now become people's actual experience. They held an exhibition in New York, but it was only their friends and supporters who liked it. Ernst then married the American painter Dorothea Tanning and set out to begin a new life far away in Sedona in the state of Arizona. She painted his portrait, Max in a blue boat. The extraordinary colors of the mountains in that part of America were a sort of liberation for him. And with Dorothea Tanning and the landscape of Arizona, Max Ernst had found himself. On the steep sides of the nearby mountains, there were a thousand faces, a thousand variations, a thousand colors. And from them came landscape paintings, abstracts, which all the same you can recognize as Arizona. They're minute. Ernst himself called them microbes. Then he did the work himself on a house he built in a deserted valley and decorated with his sculptures. When I get into a dead end with my painting, Sculpture's a way out. For sculpture is even more of a game than painting. Sculpture's like lovemaking, you have to use both hands. It's as if I were taking a holiday so I can afterwards come back to painting again. fifties, Ernst returned to Europe to live between France, in Paris or Touraine, and Arizona, and in recent years, the south of France. My wanderings, my restlessness, my impatience, my doubts, my beliefs, 
my hallucinations, my loves, my outbreaks of anger, revolt, contradiction, my refusal to submit to any sort of discipline, even if it's my own, the occasional visits of my sister Confusion, the woman with a hundred heads, all that's been hopeless for any sort of quiet and peaceful, happy work. It's like my life. My work hasn't got the harmony of classical music, classical composers, not even the harmony of classical revolutionaries. It's seditious, irregular, contradictory, unacceptable for any art expert, any theorist of culture, behavior, logic, morals, But it does have one thing, the gift to charm the people who are on my side. Poets, magicians, and a few who can't even read or write. The Grasshopper's Song to the Moon. The Marriage of Heaven and Earth. A Crystal, His Widow and His Child and the moon that's full of contentment. In 1954, Max Ernst was awarded the grand prize for painting at the Venice Biennale, which he accepted. And for that, he was expelled from André Breton's surrealist group. It wasn't the first time either. Only in the last 10 years or so, he's now in his 80s, came honors, awards, worldwide recognition. Three countries claim him for their own, Germany, France, and America. But Max Ernst, the bird, says he prefers a juicy berry to all the laurel leaves in the world. His work is a love letter to nature, and his nature is to dig right down deep. Forty years ago, a friend wrote that what was marvelous about him was the way when he got on some path, he went faster and further than anyone before.